Professor Caldor was in charge of uh, a study on the effects of Allied strategic bombing on the German war economy, the British study. Yes. Uh, there was an American study which employed about 10 times more people. The British study employed about three people. And directed by Caldor, the American study was much larger. It was directed by John Kenneth Galbraith, but it included also Japan, the East and the, the Far East. The British study was only about Germany. And the results are famous. Both of these studies found that the German war economy increased with the bombing, with the pressure which was put on the resources and the population by bombing. The result was an increase in production. It is very interesting, uh, the explanation that was given, I think, by uh, Professor Cardo himself initially is that the Germans made huge improvements in the efficiency of the organization of the war production. So whereas previously there were inefficiencies whereby certain big shots in the party had control of certain areas of the economy, they rationalized and they improved the organization. And of course you had also the the human factor, which operated in a British end too, is that the more the enemy attacks, the more you are determined <laughs> to show them otherwise. Yeah. I think that that was the effect of the bombing on Britain too. And I do remember that a 72-hour work week was not unusual. And the people who were employed in the war production were largely women and men who were not fit for military service, too old or not well enough or something. So, so that it was a, for me, the lesson I learned is that you really cannot break the spirit of a people just by brute force, whether it was on the German side or the British side, as far as the bombing is concerned. That, that is my le the le what I took away as a lesson. So when I came to Canada, initially I may say that uh, Joe got for me um, a teaching assistantship and to something at the University of Toronto, but <laughs> I decided that really the environment was really boring and not not at all interesting and. I decided that I would either work in a factory, which I had done a lot in England during vacations, or I would find work with trade unions in research. Yes. I worked for the Mine Mill and Smelter Workers Union for two years in, uh, in, in producing a 12-page tabloid newspaper, monthly or paper for them. So that's what I did, that kind of thing. I also worked for some insurance company just, right. just for the money. Yes. Well, my relationship with the Caribbean started the same time as I started at McGill in 1960. Yes. It was quite accidental. It had to do with the fact that uh, Professor Kirstead, who was then at U of T, my professor yes, at U of T, yes, he spent a sabbatical year in uh, Jamaica, he was a friend of Arthur Lewis, and uh, he was engaged in some studies. And as I later learned, this is what professors do. They send for graduate students to help with the studies, and right. that's how I, I, and that's a relationship I maintained throughout all the years I was at McGill. I had to teach whatever I was given to teach, which was money and banking first year. Mm -hmm about which I knew nothing and I was, and was not interested either. Um, but to sweeten the deal, they, they let me develop a course in techniques of economic planning. I did direct a very large study based at Statistics Canada in Ottawa on constructing input-output tables for the four Atlantic provinces. Yes. Well, you see, at that time, we had a joint department of economics and political science. It was uh, 
a joint department. And a colleague on the political science side was Charles Taylor, who was uh, a, an important figure in the newly formed NDP. And he came and asked if I would write a background paper on issues of foreign ownership. <laughs> Eventually, uh, I was asked if I would write, put the material into a book. But the, my only disappointment with that, oh, and incidentally, when the book went to be evaluated, it came back very negatively. That was not economics, that was a political tract. And the publisher, meanwhile, who was the Macmillan of Canada, came and said, no, no, we like your book. Can you think of somebody else to send it to? That will give us more favorable report. I said, sure, you try Mel Watkins. And uh, the rest is history. That's right. Yeah. Mel wrote the introduction. And uh, we, he was, at that time, himself engaged in what, what we was known in Canada as the Watkins Report. There's a study commissioned by the Minister of Finance of the day precisely on the effects of foreign direct investment on the Canadian economy. And some very well-known people were employed, engaged with um, L. Watkins in this so-called Watkins report, principally Stephen Hymer. Yes. And I, I must take the opportunity of mentioning his name to any economist who might be interested. I think he was really brilliant. The fact is that he, he left us far too soon. My interest in the, in the basically British West Indies, yes. the Caribbean, but particularly the former English colonies, it started from the time that uh, I told you Professor Kist had invited me to finish a study to help a study on inter-island shipping service. And I was so impressed by the young economists, the West Indians, many of them educated at LSE. Mm -hmm. And I maintained their contact then with Alistair McIntyre and Lloyd Best and others. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was pretty well from 1961, when, when I started to collaborate more with Lloyd Best. And we first hit on the idea about the slave plantation having been, so to speak, the original economic institution uh, of uh, those uh, countries uh, wh whose historic effects on the further development of the countries was very important. That started in 1964. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we got some funding from the McGill oh, Center for right. Developing Area Studies, brought Lloyd Best to, to Montreal and uh, and so on and so forth. Eventually, many, many years later, um, published a book on essays in plantation economy, jointly authored with Lloyd Best. I think the, con the connection came with respect to the work I had done in Canada on, uh, on subsidiaries and branch plants branch of branch multinational branch. corporations. Now, in the West Indies, of course, <laughs> these, what we might have called the representative firm, using Marshall's term, which nobody remembers anymore because they don't teach history of economic thought anymore. But the representative firm, so to speak, would have been a rather large uh, subsidiary or company in the extractive industries, in the case of the uh, West Indies, in, in, in bauxite or in petroleum or in sugar, of course, historically the most important. And these uh, large enterprises were so obviously predominating the economies of those countries, particularly at that time, <coughs> perhaps less so today that I would see the similarities really has to do with the effects of being the, the subsidiary of some foreign company, in the case of the West Indies, extractive. 